Well, welcome to another Hadrian's Wall walk, and today I'm going to go from uh, the Roman Fort and Museum of uh, Vindolanda. I'm going to catch the bus to uh, the Milecastle pub, up onto Hadrian's Wall at Milecastle 42, and walk all the way along to Windshields, the highest point, and then drop down and return to Vindolanda across the field. It's a lovely warm summer, summer's day. We'll see how we get on. So, uh, hope you can join me for all of it. Thank you. So that's me off the bus. It's a great resource through the summer, the AD122. Runs all the way from Hexham to Holtwistle. It stops at all the major routes along the way, so you can hop on and hop off as you prefer. So as we head down the road towards Caulfield's Quarry and the Mile Castle, we pass the cutting for the Stangate Roman Road, which we'll encounter again a number of times on this walk today. We pass the cutting of the Roman road and just beyond it is Holtwistle Burn Roman Fortlet, which was built in the late 1st or early 2nd century, but was probably abandoned when Hadrian's Wall was built. The cows now occupy a field which uh, held a Roman marching camp or construction camp for Hadrian's Wall, it's undecided. So we cross over the road now and head through the stile. Hadrian's Wall dead ahead of us and the shark's fin of the chopped off wall, which is Caulfield's Quarry. If you decide to do the walk from Vindelanda, it's roughly four and a half miles, or you can actually start the walk a shorter version, say from Twice Brood or the Sill Discovery Centre. My right, I'm passing under the Roman marching camp, which you can see if the lighting conditions are right. If you open up an Ordnance Survey map, you get a real impression of the number of archaeological features scattered throughout this landscape. So I'm now walking directly towards Hadrian's Wall and at this point I'm crossing the southern edge of the military zone which was the Vallum earthwork which was roughly 120 Roman feet across. It consisted of a north and south mound with a large ditch in between the two. Sometimes an intermediate mound was also built uh, along certain sections. What the Vallon was for is not exactly known. There's various speculative theories, possibly for uh, cavalry attacking from the south, as not all tribes were still friendly to Rome. This section of Vallum is particularly well preserved in a huge linear earthwork ring right the way along the landscape below the crags. In places the military way which ran behind Adrian's wall actually utilises the north bank of the Vallum. Which in fact is the case here before it starts to run up the hill and separates from the Vallum itself. Climbing up onto the remains of Hadrian's wall we can see Caulfield's quarry beneath us. Uh, a quarry from the early 20th century and as we swing round a lovely view of Mile Castle 42 at Caulfields. You can also see the Vallum running off into the distance straight as a die. Castle 42 was first excavated in 1848 and has been excavated subsequently. It's quite a magnificently preserved Mile Castle with its, both its gates intact. You can see the pivot holes where the gates would have slotted and even marking outlines the engineers would have used to place stones correctly. The internal buildings and possibly of wood must have had steps to reach the doorways as it's such a steep slope. From the top here looking west you can see Asica, the next fort in the network. A grave slab reused here was from a soldier from Pannonia which is in Eastern Europe near the Danube. It's possible about 8 to 16 men were stationed here in rotation observing the war and patrolling its various turrets. These days it's a steep descent out of the north door, but a ramp would have existed in the Roman period. So having had a look at all the different features of Milecastle 42, we now head east along Hadrian's Wall itself. This section of the Curtain Wall is generally referred to as Narrow Wall. The Romans started off with quite a broad concept for Hadrian's Wall with a walkway. But as time went on and building continued, the wall was narrowed, in some cases quite drastically, obviously to speed up building. As you walk along the ridge, you can see why the Roman builders placed their wall here along this 
300 million year old ridge of volcanic rock, the Great Windsill. The official start date for building Hadrian's Wall is AD 122, although work may have started before Hadrian arrived in Britannia to oversee the work. The section of wall I'm passing now, descending down to Thorny Doors, is an exceptional piece of wall, still several courses high and reportedly having putlog holes in when first discovered. Putlog holes just enable the scaffolding to be inserted into the wall to hold it up while the wall was being built. Along Hadrian's Wall quarries exist around and about the area, but the Romans didn't use the volcanic rock the wall is actually built on as this was too tough to quarry. Admiration for the guys who built the wall up these really steep sections, it must have been quite an effort to do. Thanks must also go to the amazing people who've built the footpaths maintain the trail and also those that keep a watching brief on Hadrian's Wall to protect it for future generations. Looking back from this elevation you get to see the Vallum stretching out into the distance, the North Pennines beyond, amazing views. Of course there's no need for the Romans to have built a ditch here, the great crags that we're walking on suffice. Coming up here you can actually see a join in the wall as we approach it. This is where two work gangs building Hadrian's Wall joined up creating this uh, strange butted joint. The Ministry of Works have cemented the whole section together but originally Hadrian's Wall would have had a mortared outer face with rubble fill, clay soil on the middle sections. So as we forward the stile there, just to give our knees some exercise, we head towards the demolished turret of 41A, known as Core Gap. When the Romans returned from the Antonine Wall in the mid-2nd century, a lot of the turrets were actually demolished down to ground level. The recesses filled in, possibly so the wall walk could continue over the top. Many turrets at this time were demolished and left unused. There was obviously a change of policy within the Roman army. At the wall's base, the remains of the wing wall can be seen, just as a row of stones. This indicates the turret was built before Hadrian's wall was connected to it, leaving these stumps. As we cross the minor road at Core Gap through the stiles, the climbing commences up onto the high point of the wall at Windshields. Behind me you can just see the curtain wall stretching out and a small section of ditch still remains on the north side. Worth stopping just here and turning back and looking at Hadrian's Wall with the North Ditch running along the windsill heading west. Plenty of wildflowers at this time of year and uh, thistles, foxgloves just to uh, get you back in touch with nature. And now we reach Milecastle 41 which is easily missed it's been thoroughly robbed out, but uh, if you take time just to walk around, you'll see the rectangular shape marked out by the robber trenches where soil has been piled up and the stone has been removed. Foundations of Hadrian's Wall still run under the modern dry stone wall. There's plenty of recycled Roman stone in the farmhouses and barns in the area. This is quite the uh, warmest day I've ever had on Hadrian's Wall. The temperature must be around 33, 34 degrees. There is quite a wind blowing up here, which is taking the edge of things. But uh, the trouble is the air is a bit like a blowtorch. So. At this point here, walkers doing the National Trail can peel off and head down to Windshields campsites or reach Twice Brood Pub by the road. This little section of Hadrian's Wall is a nice little wall garden but it uh, shows what the rubble film must have looked like on the original wall. So now we're approaching the trig point of Windshields, the highest point you'll reach on Hadrian's Wall, which is 345 metres, or 1,230 feet. 
the summit offers magnificent views 360 degrees right round to North Northumberland, the North Pennines, down into Cumbria. On a good day you'll see over into Scotland, maybe a couple of small Scottish hills in the distance. It's an often repeated myth that Scotland and England are bordered by Hadrian's Wall. But in actual fact, the whole of Hadrian's Wall is within England. The nearest Scotland comes is on the Solway Firth at Bowness on Solway and he's still half a mile away at that point. Now the keen-eyed Hadrian's Wall spotter will notice this bit of foundation just on the summit. From now on it's literally downhill all the way apart from some uphill bits further along but not quite as high as windshields. So from this point we get to see Cragloff and the body of water in the distance, Socials Crags, we also get to see Housestakes Crags as well, all to come if you're doing the National Trail, all to look forward to. Keep an eye out for a nice bit of foundation on your left hand side if you're descending. These days a lot of Hadrian's Wall probably survives in a similar state if you were to excavate it further along the wall. Now we reach the remains of Mile Castle 40, which uh, has dating ev evidence showing it was still in use until at least the mid 4th century. One of my favourite places on the wall to sit and watch the sunset. If you lean over the wire fence, you can just see a small section of facing stones on the north side of the wall. Leaving Mile Castle 40 behind, we carry on heading down the hill towards Peel Crag. At this point here the Romans decided the ditch was unnecessary because of the steepness of the crags they were facing up ahead and the north ditch comes to an abrupt terminus uh, which is just visible on the other side of the wall if you just stop and peer over. Depends on the light but normally you can see it fairly well. Hmm, just about today, but it is there. We now take a diversion from Hadrian's Wall and we are now following the Roman military way. This was built by the Romans when they returned back from abandoning the Antonine Wall in Scotland. We have no exact date for when the road was built, but uh, Antonine Wall was abandoned around about 159 to 160 AD. So the road must have been built sometime after this time. Even 1800 years on, sections of the military way are still in use by farmers and history addict walkers like myself. If you visit Agents Wall a number of times, it's definitely worth pursuing the military way on a few occasions just to get a different view of the wall. The line of the military way disappears under the tarmac now, under the road that runs up to Steelrig Car Park, which is very popular for walkers doing this part of the world, a good place to park. Now we pass the finger posts of the path that leads up onto Peel Crags and Steel Rig, but that's for another day. So we're passing Peel Cottage here, which is for rent and a great place to stay if you're looking for somewhere right against Hadrian's Wall. So we're now back onto the military road built in the 18th century. Now a very busy thoroughfare connecting all the sites along Hadrian's Wall. Twice brood is dead ahead, so time for me to stop and get a refreshing drink. In 1801, the now 78-year-old William Hutton stayed at the Twice Brood pub and was kept awake all night by noisy wagoners. Today, the pub is a lot more affable, a lot quieter, and the food's greatly improved. There's even a Dark Skies Observatory now attached to the building for those who like astronomy. Well, suitably refreshed, I'm just taking the path behind the youth hostel and the sill and uh, that takes me down onto the road 
which climbs up towards the turning for Vindalanda. Unsurprisingly in the field to my right is actually a large marching camp, possibly even a construction camp for Hadrian's Wall. Its earthworks can just be seen in low light just as the sun setting or rising. If you remember the Stainegate Roman Road from the beginning of the video, this is where it creeps along the line from seat sides down a farm track. And at this point here it becomes tarmac and forms the drive down to Vindalanda Roman Fort and Museum. So if you arrive by car to the west gate, you're actually traveling along the line of the Roman soldiers, troops and travelers from all those centuries ago. The Stengate Roman Road was built at the end of the first century AD and ran from Kirkbride in Cumbria on the coast all the way to Corbridge, which is uh, the most northerly Roman town in the empire. Along the Stengate, a series of forts were built and this formed the defensive line along the Tyne Solway Isthmus before Hadrian's Wall arrived some 20 years later. Often overlooked as you drive down the Stengate and in the vegetation is the stump of a milestone. Still in situ after 1900 years, it's top knocked off by a farmer sadly, but a full sized milestone is still in existence outside Vinland Roman Fort, marking another mile along the Stengate. To have two Roman milestones still in situ on a Roman road is unique in Britain and can only be seen on the approach to Vindalanda. It's our final little section of uh, Roman road before we reach Vindalanda now, just ahead of us. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, little ramble we've been on together. And if you have, please like and subscribe on the channel. It helps me create more content, get out and exercise a bit more. So thank you very much and uh, we'll see you again next time. Don't forget to visit Roman Vindalanda, the fort and museum, home to the Vindalanda writing tablets, which have told us so much about the Roman way of life on the frontier. Excavations go on every April to September, so you can chat to the excavators and see what's been discovered live as it happens. Fantastic, definitely worth a visit. Mm -hmm.